What's going on, besties? Today, we're going to be talking about the 2025 guidelines when it comes to the American Heart Association ACLS. There's been a lot of controversy about this, so let's get started. So first up, we have the number one thing that everybody's talking about, and that is mechanical CPR devices. So one of the things that they said during the conference is that they could see that these devices were increasing in use, but based on trials that were done over the last five years, there's not a whole lot of data that supports it. Basically, what they were saying is, is that one method being manual compression is not superior over another method being mechanical compression. So they're recommending against the use of using mechanical CPR PR devices unless there's specific situations where it needs to be done because manual CPR is not going to be efficient. So it seems like our emergency responders will still have the ability to use it because they are in a situation where manual might not cut it, but in general routine use, no mas. Another thing they mentioned was buffering agents during CPR. Specifically in this case, they seem to really focus on sodium bicarbonate. So they did have recent randomized controlled trials that kind of looked at the routine administration of buffering agents like sodium bicarbonate during cardiac arrest. And what they found was, is it doesn't actually improve return of spontaneous circulation, survival to discharge or neurological outcomes. So what they advise most Moving forward is that sodium bicarbonate specifically during cardiac arrest is not suggested unless there's a special circumstance for its use. Next up, we have IV versus IO access during CPR. They didn't really find any evidence that IO strategy being first use led to any kind of faster access or a shorter time to drug. And the outcomes are really similar regardless if they used IV or IO. They still stand on the fact that IV route continues to be the preferred method. And then IO can be a secondary method if we have failed attempts with the IV. And then we have cardiac arrest and hyperkalemia. So really there's insufficient evidence based on their finding for the use of or against calcium or bicarbonate. So they say in situations of hyperkalemia, the key choice is to continue using insulin and glucose as suggested. They also had some feedback about temperature control. So this actually changed based on the 2020 guidelines. So originally the high target was 36 degrees Celsius. Now what they're saying is they're looking at around 37.5 degrees Celsius equal to or less than that is the recommendation. And lastly, I'm going to get a whole bunch of groans and some old goodies. We have providing breaths is now back in the guidelines post COVID pandemic. If you remember during the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of concern about providing these rescue breaths during the process of CPR. So what they ended up saying during that time was because of the risk to healthcare providers, rescue breaths were not necessarily an option. If you were willing to do it, great. If not, it's okay. Well, now that we're on the other side of the COVID pandemic, they're bringing them back. So get ready to put your lips on somebody, ladies and gentlemen. They also updated the chain of survival. So previously, there was a chain of survival for out of the hospital, in the hospital, if it was an adult versus a pediatric. It was extremely confusing. So this year, their whole thing was standardization and consistency. So now we have one standardized universal chain of survival, regardless of your age and regardless of your location. So a pretty significant change as well was vasopressor medications. So in consideration with timing for adult patients in cardiac arrest with a shockable rhythm, it is reasonable to administer epinephrine after initial defibrillation attempts have failed. So there's a lot of literature apparently out there that supports um, prioritizing, I'm sorry, rapid defibrillation and administration of epinephrine after initial attempts with CPR and defibrillation is not successful in patients with shockable rhythms. And also update is that vasopressin alone or vasopressin in combination with epinephrine offers no advantages as a substitute 
for epinephrine in adult patients in cardiac arrest. They had multiple studies where they found that there was no difference in survival outcomes when comparing vasopressin alone or vasopressin combined with epinephrine versus just using epinephrine alone. Here's our second significant changes is non-vasopressor medications. So Sotolol used to be an option. Sotolol is not an option no more. New for adults in cardiac arrest, the use of beta blockers, specifically Sotolol was like the big one that would be used all the time for ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Unresponsive to defibrillation is of uncertain benefit. They found that there was no evidence that emerged from the 2025 ILCOR evidence update about the use of these medications in cardiac arrest. So as of right now, when you look at the 2025 guidelines, Sotolol has been nixed. So here are the updates to the 2025 adult cardiac arrest algorithm. So back in 2020, up here at the top where it says start CPR, it just said give oxygen. They did a little change to the verbiage where they actually give instructions. So now they say begin bag mask ventilation and give oxygen. And you're also going to find that they're going from quantitative caponography to continuous caponography. So if you're confused by what the difference is, here's like a little quick note. So quantitative caponography measures and provides a specific numerical reading of the carbon dioxide level at the end of exhalation. So in this particular situation, you're going to get a number. So for example, caponography may be 38. We know that normal is between 35 and 45. So we're getting numerical data with quantitative. Whereas with continuous, in continuous caponography, we're seeing the monitor displaying the CO2 concentration as it changes over time. So in this case, we're actually getting a waveform with time on the X axis and CO2 pressure on the Y axis. So it's giving us a little bit more information that we need to make sure that high quality CPR is being initiated. A couple key highlights that they said also was that higher first shock energy settings greater than or equal to 200 joules are preferable in lower settings for cardioversion of atrial fibrillation and flutter, as well as pulseless ventricular tachycardia is always unstable and should be treated immediately with defibrillation because delays in shock delivery worsens outcomes. So overall, the algorithm didn't change much, but they did move some things around. So one of the things that they moved around up here was the advanced airway. So typically it was a little bit lower down in our box, but I think that they probably moved it up just so that you had the information up here at the top when you're doing high quality CPR. I mean, it makes sense. One thing you're also going to notice is that they removed ROSC from the side panel. So typically you would have like a little information there about what happens once you get that return of circulation. However, now ROSC is just its own thing. It's got its own algorithm. So you're not going to find it specifically in the cardiac arrest algorithm anymore. And then the other thing that they changed too, is they also lessened the steps. So if you remember originally, this box said go to five or seven, they basically gave you an option of where it is that you want it to go. Now they're saying you're going to step five. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. Whereas with this box right here, it says to go to step 10. Previous Obviously, this said you would go to step 10 or 11. Now they're limiting that out. They're like, you know what? Go immediately to step 10. They're not giving us any options of where we want to go in the algorithm. Next up, we have the ALS termination of resuscitation. So they did update these based on newer guidelines that really emphasize the rule that in emergency medical service situations, based on their scope of practice, that they need to use more than just the end tidal carbon dioxide to make the decision to end resuscitation resuscitative efforts. So in this case, they want our EMS to actually start looking at was the arrest not witnessed? Was there no bystander during CPR? Um, was there no return of spontaneous circulation? before transport and no shock was delivered before transportation. If all of those criteria are met, then we can make the determination if we need to terminate resuscitation. So here's a look at our adult post-cardiac arrest algorithm. So like I said, ROSC, 
has its own algorithm now, and it has changed significantly, as you can see from the 2020 version. So in 2025, they added more information about airway instructions. So as you can see here, during the initial stabilization after Ross, they have assessed the airway, place and exchange advanced airway devices necessary, as well as confirm correct airway placement. So under the management of oxygenation and ventilation, you're also going to find that they added FiO2 parameters. So they want you to maintain 100% FiO2 until that SpO2 or PaO2 can be measured reliably. Reliably. Also, SpO2 has changed a little bit. So back in the 2020 guidelines, they wanted you to be between 92% to 98. I think coming out on the other side of COVID really affected a lot of this. So now we're actually seeing the range change of two degrees. They've also removed all the language about 10 breaths per minute. So that was an interesting move. I know that they are really pushing forward with avoiding excessive ventilation, which might be the reason why they remove that verbiage. And here's the major update. So previously we had systolic blood pressure hemodynamic targets. They've completely removed that. So that systolic blood pressure of greater than 90 is no longer part of the parameters. They're really only looking at the map. They want that map greater than or equal to 65. Another common theme during the conference was the fact that they really wanted to get early diagnostic imaging. So that's actually been added to the algorithm. Talking about obtaining a 12 lead EKG and considering other diagnostic imaging like CT and or ultrasound. We've also got more generalized in treating arrest etiologies and complications. So as you can see from the 2020 guidelines, they had specific things that they were looking at. STEMI patients, unstable cardiogenic shock, mechanical circulatory support required. All of that has changed. They got really, really general with it. And they're really pushing for emphasis on early PCI. So consider emergency coronary angiography and or mechanical circulatory support. And lastly, they've also added the assessment of patients off sedation and neuromuscular blockades, as well as adding a couple different things for continued management. So we're looking at coronary angiography, again, really pushing those PCIs, appropriate timing using multimodal prognostication, as well as over here on this side, we're also adding coronary angiography, depending on if they can follow commands or not. And if you take a look, this is the side panel of ROSC. You can see from 2025 to 2020, there's been a significant difference in the way that they're changing language languages and things like that. You're going to find that they removed all of the H's and T's from the 2025 guidelines. They don't even have those listed there at all. You can see other updates where they've added more airway obstructions here about the management of the airway. You find all of the oxygenation and ventilation updates that we discussed before as well as the systolic blood pressure targets no longer being a thing. Uh, they're mostly looking at MAP targets now more than anything else. And the emphasis of early diagnostic testing is there as well. If you move a little bit further down into the continued management piece, they removed from the 2020 algorithm and added it here that, that information about persistent ST segment elevation, cardiogenic shock, recurrent refractory uh, ventricular arrhythmia, severe myocardial ischemia, all the stuff that was actually in the algorithm algorithms now been added to the side panel. Uh, they also added being off sedation and neuromuscular blockade if we're unable to do so. And then that new temperature goal management is here as well. It was 32 degrees to 37.5. Previously, it was 32 to 36. So big change in regards to temperature uh, target management. They also added that multimodal approach to making sure that we are prognosing patients appropriately and then adding ongoing critical care parameters as you move forward taking care of these individuals. And here's the update for the adult tachyarrhythmia with a pulse algorithm. So in the 2020 version, synchronized cardio version, the instructions for that was to refer to the specific devices recommended energy level to maximize first shock success. However, in 2025, synchronized cardio version has its own algorithm now, and they want you to refer to that algorithm 
for specific guidelines. And if it's not known, then you can use the maximum settings on the machine. Another verbiage change as well is that with synchronized cardioversion, previously it said to consider sedation, and now they have changed that language specifically to sedate whenever feasible. My recommendation is, is please sedate your patients when we're doing synchronized cardioversions. It doesn't feel nice. And here's that big practice change that we were talking about before. So Sotolol used to be a recommended type of medication that we can give in these specific patient populations. However, Based on recent research, they weren't able to find any positive outcomes, it seems, with using this routinely. So now Sotolol has been removed from the antiarrhythmic infusions for stable wide QRS tachycardia. And here you go. Here is your brand new electrical cardioversion algorithm. So it takes you through the whole steps. Tachycardia, is it there? Great. If ventricular rate is greater than 150, we prepare for immediate cardioversion. Then they want to make sure you have everything you need at the bedside, your oxygen monitor, your suction device, your IV line, intubation equipment, just in case. Here's your sedate whenever feasible. I hope that we're actually sedating these individuals. And then here are your guidelines based on the rhythm that you're seeing and what they recommend in regards to joules. So atrial fibrillation and flutter both seem to be set at 200 joules. Narrow complex tachycardia is at 100 joules. Monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is at 100 joules. And then when we have polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, it is unsynchronized high energy shock, also known as defibrillation. So here's the update for the adult bradycardia with a pulse algorithm. So we do have some practice changes based on 2020. So initially in 2020, what they originally had was after the identification of this bradycardia, we wanted to identify and treat the underlying cause. However, that has been moved. So now it's actually a little bit further down and they added cardiopulmonary compromise first. So they want to make sure if there's any kind of hypotension, acutely altered mental status, signs of shock, ischemic chest discomfort or acute heart failure. They want you to identify those things or not before you move down the algorithm. So here's a little bit of a closer view. You now you can see that cardiopulmonary compromise being added there. And then you make a decision whether you're going to move to assessment and support or treat the underlying causes. Um, the one thing that they did move from the assessment and support was the IV access. I guess they just assume that the patient already has IV access, so they didn't include it in there. Uh, but we also have here where they added that cardiopulmonary compromise as well. Um, so they did add a little bit to this, but overall, like the medication doses and things like that really haven't changed for the 2025 guidelines. And that's all of the major updates when it comes to the 2025 guidelines. As always, I'm going to be updating these videos once we get closer to the implementation date. That won't be until March of 2026. So we have a little bit of time. I want to make sure I review everything and we get all of the nice juicy details before we release that video. But if it's time, if we have passed that time and you want to watch it, make sure you click right here. That's where all of the AHA, AHA videos will be housed. As always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye everybody.